let you know what's going on. I'm Angela Birdsong, also affectionately known as the Medicare Lady, because I help people transition on to Medicare. And with my co-host, Miss Mary Jirasi. Hello. Jordanist. Extra- Jordanist. Jordan. Journalist. <laughs> wow. Okay. Journalist yeah. extraordinary. I'm the enemy of the state. Remember, <laughs> journalist. That's me. Uh, we have an auspicious occasion besides these two fantastic ladies who are going to tell us all about uh, Hillsborough County Schools and what's been going on with the voucher system, on and on and on. But it's your birthday. It really is. So, everybody okay, out there. I'm proud to say it's the big five nine. Oh. <laughs> For the third time or the first time? The first oh, time. Oh, 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 my gosh. Just okay. joking. You know me. Silly girl. So let's get started. Hey, we got two exciting ladies here. Yes, they absolutely. They are joining us from the League of Women Voters for Hillsborough County. And one is Patricia Hall and the other one is Teresa Potter. Yep. And we are talking about a real serious topic, though. Charlie. <laughs> oh, there's your there applause you for being here. We're so happy to have you. Talking about a serious topic today, yeah. charter schools. Yeah. But first, we're going to get a little background on these ladies. Uh, first, um, Pat, let's talk about you, your background, what's your ne- unique story, and where you're born and raised, and how you got where you are right now. Um, I was born in Nyack, New York, and uh, moved to Fort Lauderdale when I was uh, five. My father was in um, the construction industry. And uh, grew up in Fort Lauderdale, went to FSU, majored in uh, home economics, which is now family and consumer science. And I was a teacher in Hillsborough County for 35 or so years. Uh, Did a stint at Tampa Catholic for six years. And I retired about 10 years ago. And I've been involved in the league ever since 1982. And we took on this study of charter schools, which is how we research issues. Okay. And uh, we started this in 2013. So we've been... You were look- chair of the education is yes. uh, committee, is that correct? Yes. Give me your title, your former title, excuse me. I was formerly chair of the education committee, but I've been president of the league and membership chair. And Wow. So you've we, l- we, held a lot of titles. Yes. Yes. Why, why was education important to you? Because it's been my career, and um, I see the value and how important it is to our democracy. Public education is the root of our democracy, and without it, we're lost. Wow, that is some powerful words. Now, Teresa, let's hear about your background. Hello. And our current education chair, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Current education chair for the Hillsborough County League of Women Voters. There we go. I'm the past legislative chair for um, Hillsborough County PTA. Um, originally, I'm from Oklahoma City. Wow. I moved also to Fort Lauderdale, which is very interesting. <laughs> oh, um, Fort how, Lauderdale is however, where the educators I, are. I wasn't five. I was 19. <laughs> That's how I ended up in Florida. Um, I met my current husband, um, and he lived in Tampa. That's how I ended up in Tampa. I, grad- I did graduate from Florida Atlantic University over on that coast, and then um, I worked as a financial advisor and then as a um, assistant vice president in the technology department with a large um, global financial firm for many years until I had my first son when I was 2001. And that was when I got involved in education. (laughs) How did you get into education? We were talking about librarian, right? Yes. Yes. So I have two boys. They are now in 11th and 12th grade. But when they were starting in public schools, I got involved in public schools. Um, Once they were both in school, I started substituting to see where I might want to work in public schools. And decided that I was going to become a media specialist. So I went back to school. I got my master's from USF. Very um, nice. And as with my public library degree. And um, I started working um, at Lockhart Elementary School here in Hillsborough County as a media specialist. And I was there for three years. Um, And then last year I was actually um, job sharing at Middleton High School as media specialist. So I have some elementary and some high school experience there. But I've been involved... um, for advocacy for public education and for education in general um, ever since my kids got into school. I've been the president of the PTA at their elementary school, at their middle school. I've been the president of a parent organization at one of their high schools and involved in many other things along the way. Um, And so I ended up becoming a loud public advocate for public education um, 
about three years ago. So this is hope for people who feel like they don't understand. Loud is good. Loud is very good. If they don't don't understand what we're talking about here today, three years ago, I didn't either. And so I got involved when I was president of the PTA at uh, my son's middle school. I started a PTSA student board. I shouldn't say I started it. They had one before, but revamped it um, and talked to the students about what they wanted to get involved in. And they decided that that year they wanted to get involved in helping reducing the amount of testing that we have in schools. Because we had heard from the principal of that school that um, we were losing about 25 instructional days to testing, specifically wow. to state testing at the yeah. end of the year. Yeah. Um, and that particular year, it hit us hard because um, testing was running all the way to the end of the year um, once the mandate went into place that all testing had to happen later in the year. So the eighth graders could no longer have their student week. And so that impacted our students. And so they wanted to be loud about that. So we got a lo- local um, state representative to do a conference call with us to teach them how to talk to people. And we were watching the legislative session that year specifically because there was supposed to be a reduction in the number of end of course exams, which are um, shortened to EOCs um, to parents all over Hillsborough County. Our students have to take a number of state EOCs for various courses. Um, and that year we were hopeful that the state legislature was going to reduce some of those. So our students got very vocal. So we were watching the legislative session that year and they did drop one test. We lost the algebra two EOC was eliminated, which was a huge victory, but we had hoped that year to also not have the history EOC and the civics EOC and, um, the geometry EOC because they're a duplication of testing all they were implemented mostly for uh, teacher evaluation purposes. We already do district exams for all of these courses, and those exams would stay in place if we didn't have these state end-of-course exams. And they're easier to, um, the process of giving them to students is easier because you can do them on pencil and paper instead of having to rotate all the students through the computers on campus, which is what takes the amount of time that it takes. Yeah, most of my uh, teacher friends who are disenfranchised with teaching talk about the testing and having strangers come in and, you know, evals and looking at you and judging you and um, like they're stressed out enough, you know, (laughs) Yes. and with all the the copious testing and things. So that was a good move. I remember when that was happening. Yes. So our students were fighting for that and we were watching it. And because we were watching it, we all became aware of the, um, the House Bill 7051 that year, which passed, that was just devastating to public education, shifted a lot of our money to, um, to charter schools, to private schools, um, we, we lo- lost additional dollars. So not only did we not get an elimination of all the tests that we were hoping for, but we had our eyes on the bill when other things that were happening that were really important. And so that's when I started paying attention to what our state legislature was doing when it came to bills in our Which schools. Which is not much for anybody. Um, you know, I'm just going to say it. This is the last couple of years, the worst state legislators I've ever seen. Uh, sneaking around behind our backs, passing things that we didn't vote on. Um, Angela and I, Amendment 4, we discuss it every show. We're still upset about still that. Still upset about Amendment 4. Because, we went um, into the, the streets. Right we now. went into the streets. I went into this neighborhood. I spoke to people. I got paper signs. So did she. I mean, we, we worked and we get turned around. The You know, the the highway to nowhere, de- decimating. Schools. Yeah. We can just go on and on and on. Yeah. So how did how do you think that happened? Pat, do you have any insight of uh, how why you think that bill got passed? Um, I think because Jamie Grant was the chair of the um, committee, and he is one of the most arrogant, insolent, um, non-listeners I have ever run across. And um, I actually had that conversation with him, and he was just dumbfounded when I said to him, you don't listen. Uh, I think uh, he thinks... Obviously, it's the right thing for his party, but it's not the right thing for the citizenry. So you think it's bipartisan? Bipartisanism oh, had a lot to do with absolutely. this? Absolutely. I think the Republican Party sees the future coming, and it's not them. So they're scared. I believe so. Yeah. Well, I got some good news for you. There's a teacher running against him. Her name is Jessica Harrington. Oh, yeah. We'll yeah. hopefully have her on the show soon, huh? Yeah, that's right. She's so, doing uh, good we stuff. we got some teachers who are stepping up and yep. are running for office, and we want to support them. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. So the, the bill got passed, and then what happened? Uh, obviously, you were devastated. 
Yes, and we've been watching what's been happening in the legislature ever since. So we've been, since that time, um, publishing information through Hillsborough County PTA, through, um, I also have another friend, she and I have started a community group called Coffee with the Candidates, where we invite in people who are running for office to talk to us about what they're planning to do, and we uh, uh, disseminate a lot of information to y- the public. You were talking a little fast, okay. and I love what you say, <laughs> but okay. Coffee with the Candidates, yes. if you have any websites or phone numbers okay. or any way we can get our constituents, okay. our constituents, I'm running for something. Yeah. <laughs> Our uh, viewers yes. educated. Yes, because okay. we want everybody Let to know what's again. actually happening in in the legislature Absolutely. as it's happening. So we started, um, it's a group called um, Coffee with the Candidates Tampa. Okay. And we have a Facebook page that's just that. And so if Coffee I go with to the Facebook. Candidates Tampa. And so when we hold events, okay. um, you can you can be, um, follow us through Facebook, Coffee with the Candidates Tampa. What Do you have one coming um, up? We haven't scheduled any for now. We usually do it with candidates. But um, whenever we have people who follow our page that tell us they're interested in something, we, we sometimes invite other people in. So when we were doing the referendums on education and transportation, we invited people in to talk to, to our community about that. Um, we've recently gotten some requests to talk about what's happening um with our um, judicial branch, things that are happening with the Supreme Court. So we'll probably do some things on that. that, You know what? Most people have no idea who to vote for when it comes to the judges. So the information you can give people, that is a great service you're doing. Yes. So um, we haven't exactly pinpointed our first date, but I'm sure that we'll be starting up within the next month or so. So there'll be things on our Facebook page to watch for that. And Pat, at the same time, our listeners and viewers out there, because you can see us and hear us, um, how do they get in touch with the League of Women Voters? Do you encourage that, people to join, join women to join, get get involved with the programs? Yes, yes. The League um, has a website, hclwv.org. That's right. Yeah. Okay, L- we could find it on Google but if you too. Type, yes. You know, if you sure. type in Hillsborough League of Women Voters, yep. it's going to come up. Yep. And I'm happy to say I sit on the board now. Absolutely. Yes, I'm enjoying my time. Just to let you know, the league is bipartisan. So if you are a Democrat, if non- you're non- nonpartisan, <laughs> <laughs> nonpartisan, because Correct. we have Democrats, we have independents, and we have Republicans. So it doesn't matter. What? Oh, we, hey, we could have Green Party people in there for all I know. Or or, or me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what are you? Well, uh, yeah. I'm <laughs> open minded, and I and I vote for the right people every single time. I'm going to have to put a little kibosh on the conversation for a moment because we got to go to the break and help pay these bills. But thank you. This has gotten off to an exciting start. Lots of info. Junior, your motivational guru. This is the DLD Motivational Moment. One darn second. America since 2017 is suffering from a serious hiccup. 9-11 is seriously overused in a distasteful manner. Every day the cops are calling on an innocent, innocent person of color. It amazes me that America has come down to this. A person of color becomes a person of interest. Waffle House, the dorm, Starbucks is a few. This is not the lunch counters, sit-ins of the 1960s. 2019 harassed simply for being black and proud. Hold on one darn second. This has been the DLD Motivational Moment. Pre-order my new book, Motivational Moments, at DLD28-2002 at yahoo.com or 813-394-5875. Jazz at Miss Kindness House is brought to you by Ray Williams Funeral Home, providing the highest quality, professional, and caring service for your family. Call Jeffrey Rhodes at 813-253-3419. That's 813-253-3419. Or visit him at 301 North Howard Avenue, Tampa, Florida. Ray Williams Funeral Home, for the finest care and quality service. In Touch Radio, where you can listen to a cruising flow of smooth soul and jazz. Today's R&B, a fun touch of hip-hop and gospel. All my music on one station. Giving you a buffet of music, news, and entertainment. We're In Touch Radio. Of women voters. 
And as I said, um, you can be you can represent any party and be part of the league. And here are some of the um, things that they think are important. They're they're fighting for voting rights, education, ethics and campaign finance, gun safety, health care. I know they love Medicare for all, juvenile justice, natural resources, transportation, and the national popular vote. I'm going to add to that the ERA because I'm going to a luncheon next week with the league on uh, getting the Equal Rights Amendment passed, which a lot of women don't even know. That amendment was never passed. It failed by one state. So maybe yeah. Florida can be the one to get it over the hill. Yeah, and it's, <laughs> and it's on the record every year, every single year, and it just gets overlooked constantly thank you ladies so there's something for everybody that's right don't be afraid to get involved do you have and an issue too. males uh, females any there. any any party affiliate no party affiliate get involved if you can i unfortunately can't which causes me great chagrin because of my schedule so let's get back to tracks and we're going to begin at the beginning like we, we are let's used talk to about when this charter yeah. school issue started coming yeah. to the forefront i hadn't heard of charter schools it until possibly the last three or four years you know they've made it to the limelight it's crept in pat can you give us some background well charter schools started in florida in 1996 um under the auspices of uh jeb bush really pushed this, uh, and he hired John Hage, who became the uh, basically the writer of the charter school law. And then John Hage started Charter School USA, his own multi-million dollar oh, company nice. of charter how schools. Nice. <laughs> so that's when charters started, um, but they have grown uh, exponentially, I guess. Mm -hmm. When we started looking at charters, we had about 203,000 students in Florida that were in charters. And um, currently we have approximately 275,000 children in charters. And it was 7% of our school district's population. Now it's 11%. Wow. Still low. Yeah. But can you, can you, Teresa, can you explain what a charter school is? We're going to go down to bare minimums and basics. I don't think everybody has all the details about charter schools. I know I don't have all of it. So what is a charter school and how do we define it? Probably the simplest and easiest way to explain it is it's a, it's a public school. It's run by public dollars in the state of Florida, except that the management is not the school district of the county. So we have the school district of Hillsborough County and school district of Hillsborough County operates all of our um, boundary schools, our neighborhood schools, as we know them as public schools. Right. Um, but there's outside management companies that operate our charter schools. External companies. So there's yeah. still public schools in Hillsborough County. They're still paid for with public dollars, but they're not managed and operated by Hillsborough County public schools. Why would that be? What would be the benefit of that? I think that because um, there's there's been a nationwide push to um, to privatize public education. And I think the people who are proponents of it believe that if there's less bureaucracy, that it's better for students. Um, the research, um, as I mentioned before, I'm a librarian, so I tend to rely on a lot of research. Uh -huh. The research has shown that the vast majority of schools that are operated by private managers are not showing better results for students. Um, but I think there's still a lot of people that believe that. I think we do have a lot of legislators that truly believe that this is better for our students, even though the research has shown that that is not now, the case. Now, would you say it's kind of a hodgepodge? I mean, I've heard great charter schools, and then you have the ones who people are just, hey, I got an idea. I'm going to open up a charter now. That's true. And the next thing you know, um, they're closed down. Yes. And we've had fraudsters, yes. people who are taking advantage of the system, yes. coming into uh, charter schools. Good point. So yep. it's really kind of a Good hodgepodge point. going yep. on. It is, and it's very important to start the conversation by saying that there are really great charter schools. And if every charter school looked like our really great charter schools, mm -hmm. then we would probably already have a complete system where we had outside operators and school district run schools. There, there, there was complete transparency and oversight and they were all being run by, by truly nonprofit organizations that are not out to put money in their pockets, then it would be a great system. And so that's probably our biggest gap in, um, is that a lot of our schools um, are not really in it to make sure that the student has the best experience. There are people that are out there that are running charter schools specifically to make money off of it. 
And when you have that kind of privatization and, and, and the um, current law makes it difficult to monitor those companies, mm. then that's why we have an issue now where we have charter schools that are not providing the best education for our system. Pat, do you feel that the national boost for charter schools, Betsy DeVos being a big advocate of that, who has no business being in education at all she wasn't a teacher she went to private schools that's another mess do you think that's um, spearheading a lot of this i don't think it's spearheading um it's rubber stamping but uh the history of betsy devos uh starting in michigan uh their schools have decreased i think 80 percent in reading levels wow since charter schools have been forced on them by her advocacy. So she is not a fan of public education. As you said, she has been educated in Calvary, Calvary Lutheran schools. Yeah. And um, the, the general philosophy is that children don't have a chance if they have a school in a poor zip code and school choice is going to give them all these wonderful options. But what has happened here is that we have a lot of segregation yeah. in the charter yep. schools. This is a way for parents to put their children in schools with children like them. And uh, we have a large number of schools that are white. We have a large number of schools that are all black in Hillsborough County. We have a couple that are Hispanic. And we have one that replicates the demographics of the school district, which is approximately 23% um, black, 36% white, and about 35% uh, uh, Hispanic. So it's a, it's a form of segregation. That because is basically you're saying if, if a parent is involved in their child's life, they're gonna really gonna be the driver of what school they're gonna end up in. Right. Exactly. And so if you're if you happen to be a child who their parent is working two jobs and they don't have the time, they don't have the ambition, they don't even have the knowledge, then that child who gets stuck in private in, in public school is gonna have a different experience. So that's a good good lead in for a question I had. Um, Teresa, if I have a child that I want to get into a charter school, I know there's vouchers. Uh, do they look at how much your income is? Do you get a, any kind of money towards your child's education if you don't have the funding? How do, do charter schools so, work? How so, do I get a kid in a charter so school? So charter schools, there is public money also going towards private schools. That Some of what you just said would be more related to that. Charter schools are public schools and free to people okay, to so go there. anybody can go to a charter there, school. There can be barriers to entry. They um, choose their students, though. They, That's what I'm saying, right? There, there can be barriers to entry, including um, many of our charter schools require parents to volunteer a certain number of hours for their okay. students to go there. And as we know, there are parents who would be unable to do that. Um, the transportation um, is not provided, so that can be difficult. So if they put a charter school in a certain neighborhood, they're much more likely to get students just from that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, others might have a difficulty getting there. Um, they might require a specific uniform. Many of them require a specific uniform, which uh, might be too expensive for some of our parents to provide. Um, and, and because there's a lack of oversight, um, we hear from parents all the time that they have been told that that charter school doesn't provide the services that their student needs and that they need to go back to their boundary school. Um, technically, they're not allowed to do that. They're not allowed to tell a student that they can't be at their school. Mm -hmm. um, but and, and they will say that they're not doing that, but parents are telling us otherwise. So we're trying to, tr we're trying to get the school district to put in place a process that tracks a student when they go to a charter school and when they come back to their boundary school and see if they are, if, if they've received the education that they should have received, if they're still on par with their classmates, and if they left for some reason that's not technically legal. They should never be asked to leave a charter school for a reason um, that maybe they have a special need or maybe they require additional services. Because that's our one of our biggest issues with, um, with schools that are not managed by the school district is frequently, whether it's private or charter, they're choosing not to educate our most expensive students. Mm -hmm. 
And who are the most expensive students? Who would that be? Students that require additional services. It could be um, that they have a special need. It could just mean that they... Um, they need a tutor with right. them, someone to transcribe their paperwork, write things if down. If they have... Special um, needs. Asperger's, autism, yes. Yes. Um, handicapping conditions, uh, if they're in a wheelchair, uh, all those children cost more to educate because they require more aids. Yeah. And um, charters will pretty much take anybody. And then as soon as they get their funding on FTE week, full-time equivalency week in October, they're ready to send them back to somewhere else. And in addition to what Teresa's saying about hearing from parents, we're also hearing from employees of the school district mm -hmm. that particularly guidance counselors, that these kids are coming back, they're behind. Oh. Um, kids Community College sends a lot of kids back to Rogers Middle School wow. in February because so, they uh, aren't going to score well on the state tests. And everything is about the test grade, I mean the grade for yes. the school. Parents look at only that. and They don't look beyond the front door. Um, you just said something that they get funding during that funding week and then they send the students away so they keep the money yes. of the students that they actually return yes wow they cherry what a rip pick, off what they a rip cherry off. pick students Good grief. so they keep those that are going to score well and give them a good school grade wow. and they send back the others in addition to as teresa was talking about these special needs students they send out their discipline problem children and back to the public schools who has to educate everyone. So how did this happen? This is mind boggling to me. It's it's like you get to make money, you get to cherry pick, you get ratings based on using children as pawns. The kids are the pawns. Well, to me, they, they're saying that, oh, well, those public schools are so awful. You don't want to send your children there. First it was homeschooling. Then I think it went to charter schools. But, I mean, the the public school has gotten such a bad rap. Then why would you want to send someone you love there? Because the marketing of charter schools is phenomenal. They are phenomenal at marketing. Um, one of the things we did, uh, the league, along with the PTA and the teachers union, we showed a movie last year, Backpack Full of Cash, okay. which um, kind of illustrates what's happening here. Uh, it's set in Philadelphia, which has a worse problem than we do here. But, well, that's a major um, city. That's big. You alluded to the fact, Angela, that uh, schools have closed. 30% of charters in Florida have closed. They get hundreds of thousands of dollars to start up schools. And then they go out of business. Good note to end on. We'll continue with this conversation after we're done paying the bills. We're on our second break. Thank you so much. Another riveting... at the Walters Academy for Entrepreneurship, a place that we like to call The Way, where we're educating today's youthpreneurs to be tomorrow's billionaires through social entrepreneurship. Do you have a student who's bored, frustrated, gifted, inquisitive, creative, business-minded? Then maybe you need to check The Way out. Listen, we have an educational platform that allows for individualized instruction. It's strength-based, project-based, and designed to help your students become the absolute best they can while starting their own business and being an entrepreneur. If you're looking for something different and you need to find a more excellent way, then you need to visit us at The Way. That's The Way, www.thewaetampa.org. Or you can call us at 813-603-7923. We look forward to showing your student a more excellent way at The Way. This is Trina Johnson with Caldwell Banker Real Estate, the real estate agent you've been looking for. If you want top dollar for your home or you're looking to make a purchase, call me at 813-244-6953. Again, 813-244-6953 and let me list your home. When it comes to reality radio, everyone is a star. Shining star for you to see what your life can truly be. On your smooth soul and R&B station. <laughs> In Touch Radio.
Welcome back uh, for uh, the third part of our show. We have the League of Women Voters here today uh, talking about charter schools. Pat Hull and Teresa Potter, thank you for being here. It's a riveting conversation. A very, very important issue to parents and to um, those little those little beings that we love. And voters. I mean, you know, if you have a kid and you vote, you need to hear about this conversation. You you need to take uh, note. Uh, it's a it's a nonpartisan issue. Charter schools. It affects everybody. It's affecting you, no matter what you vote for or you don't for, vote for, and your children. So. Funding is interesting. I have a little piece of paper here, which throws it into a uh, light. Charter schools are run like privately owned schools. Public schools are not. Charter schools get their funding from state tax income, grants, awards, and donations. Public schools get their funding from federal government, state government, and local government. So what kind of discrepancy is that? How does that work? I still, you know, are they getting more money? I just heard that they're getting $210 million and uh, public schools got nothing. We do have some charter schools in the area that um, do get donations and funding from some of those other sources. But many of the char- charter schools in the state of Florida are getting 100% of their funding from the state of Florida. This very similar to our to our boundary public schools in our neighborhoods. Yeah. Um, Pat, do you know if they get um, federal dollars as well? I believe the federal uh, income for public education has shrunk to maybe 6%. It's very minute. Most of the funding comes from the state sources. And um, to answer your question about the differences, what we have discovered in our research is that charter schools allocate um, 25 to 40% of those state dollars to what they call lease fees and rents and so forth. And they have, some of them have 40 year leases with the school district that the school district has no control over the amount of money spent on leases and rents. So uh, at some point it'll be $132,000 a month to rent a charter school building. And when we talk about that money, that's money that um, we, we refer to as our per student dollars. So every student gets a set amount of money from the state um, every year, and that's allocated to our schools around the state. So a charter school says, I have this many students, and if the current student funding number is $7,600 per student, they're going to get $7,600 times the number of students they have at their school. And Pat's saying that they use a very large percentage of that for their leasing. In addition to the per student funding, um, for the at least the last... Um, decade, would you say? Yeah. Um, we There's also funding allocated by the state um, under what we call our PICO dollars, which is our public education outlaw, out, outlay. Outlaw. I know. Yeah. Okay. Out, <laughs> outlay um, and um, capital outlay, public education capital outlay. And that's those are dollars that are specifically for building schools and maintaining schools. So you... In addition to the per student funding that they can use for their lease, they can also get state dollars to build the building and own the building and maintain it later. And um, when we started following this, we discovered that when our state legislature started moving towards privatizing our education, they started not providing equitable funding between our normal public schools and our charter schools in, in that public outlay. So... Pat said in the beginning, there were 7% of students in charter schools. Now there's 11% of students in charter schools. So still 89% of our students are in our, in our traditional neighborhood public schools. And yet for the last many years, our, our PICO dollars, and I have a piece of paper with that, with those numbers, um, in starting in 2011, um, for the numbers that I have here, that year, a hundred percent of the PICO dollars went to charter schools. Wow. So our legislators, I read about that right there. In, yeah. in 2011, in 2012, they voted for a hundred percent of Pico dollars to go to char- charter schools. The year after that, they decided to give $6 million back to our neighborhood public schools while leaving 90 million going to charter schools. 
The year after that, the split was $75 million to charters and $53 million to public. And it's continued with charter schools receiving the majority of the funding, um, except for one year, the 2017-18, as we were leading into an election cycle. But it still was $50 million to charter schools and $50 million to public schools. So 50% of the funding in each when 89% of our students are on one side of that. So what's happened in Hillsborough County, as many of you know, is that we haven't been able to build our new schools and we haven't been able to maintain our schools with the public dollars that we should be getting to provide for that. Off. Yes. Yeah. And we just had that huge snafu where they had to go in and fix all the air conditioning yes. in schools, which is not even completed. They're still right. in there with fans. Yes. Right. And the infrastructure had not been upheld. The school buildings had not been maintenanced. And the, and the 21 air conditioners that were replaced this summer were not replaced with state dollars. They were replaced with our local referendum that our local voters voted to put in place yes, because yes, our state legislature reminder, is not providing. Uh, yes. uh, on our <laughs> last ballot, we had um, a referendum where you could vote for extra money to go to transportation <coughs> and to schools. Right. And thank goodness for that um, initiative by voters, residents of Hillsborough County, because uh, without that, those dollars, what would happen to our schools? That's right. We're $1.3 billion in the hole in maintenance needed in our public schools because of the lack of money that we've received. And we have spent about $168 million on charter schools in the last year in this county alone. So um, one thing I wanted to add about the PICO dollars, public educational capital outlay dollars are funded by landline phones. So landlines. Yes. What's that? And that that <laughs> amount of one. that amount of money has decreased yep. because of people turning off their landline sure. phones. Who has one, right? So um, at some point, that money is going to dry up. But it's been so inappropriately allocated, as Teresa, you know, laid out to the charters. And the other point that we haven't made is that. These buildings that basically we're paying for indirectly through the leasing and the rent fees and whatever, they are the property of the charter school owners and managers. And John Hage with Charter School USA and Mike Strader with Charter School Associates, um, they become the owners of these buildings through their investors and LLCs out the yin yang. The last time we checked, there were 344 LLCs under John Hage with Charter School USA. So Are they here in this Florida? is this, yes, yeah. This is a money grab. It's a money grab. So I get a building, even if my charter school fails, I end up with a building that we pay for. I yes. pay for. You pay for as taxes. Yes, and then taxes, and we get to keep it, and we could open it up to anything we want once the school's uh, ended, right? Even if it goes defunct. And parents think oh they're God. getting something great because they have a new shiny building, which we haven't been able to provide as taxpayers, and they don't look beyond the front door. The principals in charter schools don't even have to have a high school degree. Wow. Teachers, I know what my new job is. <laughs> teachers are required to be Good certified, grief. but not necessarily in the subject they teach. In the public school, you have to be certified in the subject you're teaching. Absolutely. And what, about, what about benefits for these employees? They have almost no benefits, no retirement. Um, some charters provide small amounts, but nothing like the public school system. There's no pension. So I have said to charter school teachers, why are you staying there? You need to get in the pension system right? since you're not being no. paid much to start with. Well, I will tell you that it's not as easy to get into the public school system as it probably is to get into a charter. Right. Could be oh, true. Exactly. There. And there's a tremendous teacher shortage. 300,000 300, qualified teachers in public school right now in our, in our area. 300,000 in Florida. But parents just don't understand the difference between the classroom experience in charters and the classroom experience in the public school system. It sounds system. horrific. It sounds horrific. They don't have to have degrees. They don't have to be qualified to teach what they're teaching. I mean, wow. It, it just sounds like a money grab. And 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 speaking I, of a money grab, um, we uh, worked with the county commission this past spring on the issue of um, charter school associates asked the county commission to give them a $35 million tax-free bond issue 
saying that they were going to improve their teacher salaries and curriculum materials and whatever. And Les Miller at the meeting on April 3rd said, this is not about a school. This is a real estate deal. Wow. Bless his heart. Okay. The county commission came, came through. The county commission changed the vote. They had voted for them in February. Mary Ella Smith brought it back to the county commission. So they were denied their $35 million bond issue when we revealed the facts of what was going on. Well, there was a lot of confusion around that vote. Yes, there and, was. And the board of county commission was confused. Yes. Yeah. It, <laughs> okay. So, yeah. So there was it, a lot. It's nonsensical. Here. It's bizarre. You know, it, there's so many surreal things going on in our government nowadays. I mean, how can we keep up with it? Thank God you're here. Because this is a deep subject. I mean, there's so many layers of, like you said, fraud, 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 fraud. Speaking of fraud, there has been a prosecution in Escambia County, Pensacola, with New Point Charter Schools, which were in, we had one in Hillsborough, there were four in Pinellas, there were some in Duval and Brevard, and they, um, the owner got 20 years in prison for fraud, and his manager got four and a half years in prison. Wow. It's the greed factor. It's there. Yeah, and it's, it's national, it's uh, statewide. It's, it's not in every state. I think there's, uh, in our state, I mean, yeah, statewide yeah. And, and, you know, with the, yeah. the national push for charter schools, excuse because me. Because our Republican legislature yeah. is owning charter schools. Richard Corcoran and his wife own a charter school in Pasco County, and he's the commissioner the of Corcoran's education for Florida. Deep into this deep. Yes. John Legg, Eric Friesen pushed this for eight years in the legislature, and then he went to prison for not filing his tax returns for the eight years he was in the legislature. Wow. Well, this was a lot more grim than I expected. Um, speaking of grim, we have to go to a break again. Okay. <laughs> we have We're to pay our bills. We're going to come back with some solutions. So let's yeah. think about what we can do that's, as citizens. Yeah, that's, we need that. Some solutions. Let me get to my solutions. This is Linda Archie with Tayo Temple United Methodist Church. Join us every first and third Saturday of the month at the Village Market East Tampa, 3206 North Sanchez Street. Free parking, free admission, fresh produce, live entertainment, vendor shopping, and delicious cooked food. Join us every first and third Saturday of the month, beginning June 22nd. For vendor information, call me, 1-888-991-2502. See our ad in In Touch News or Florida Sentinel. Please call me at 1-888-991-2502. The Village Market at East Tampa, 3206 North Sanchez Street. Been in a car crash? Call Ricky. Don't know what to do? Ask Ricky. We will connect you with a lawyer and doctor experience in auto accident injuries. Call Ricky at 844-361-7425. After an auto accident, you have 14 days to seek medical attention. You may be in pain. So call Ricky. Ask Ricky for your best options. 844-361-7425. Call Ricky. Ask Ricky is a legal and medical referral service. The lawyers in our network pay to receive referrals. When it comes to reality radio, everyone is a star. I know that's right. On your smooth soul and R&B station. On the World Wide Web. Access, Access granted. granted. In Touch Radio. So much information. Thank you. I mean, and it's not, it's not been good. So we're going to leave you with some hopeful information, that uh, news you can use, and a way that you can help combat this fraudery, if that's such a word, fraudness. Um, <laughs> Teresa wanted to chime in on one more thing that we needed to know. Yes. Heads up on this one, folks. Yes. So I think the number one thing that you can do is by is be educated. So we're going to make sure you have all the information all right. that you can that you need. So the Knowledge last is power. The that's last thing why we're here. that we haven't talked about in great detail is the money that's going to private schools. So we talked about public money that's going to charter schools, which are the ones not operated by the school district. But we now, um, in this shift towards privatization of education, a lot of money over the last decade has also been shifted to private schools. 
Um, so when we talk about charter schools, charter schools in the state are required to do the same state testing that our kids do. We, we talked about how the people get around that, but they're still required to do the state testing. They're required to follow the same curriculums for the most part. Some of them can do something different, but there's some slight oversight. <laughs> Private schools, there is absolutely no oversight. Teachers do not need to be certified. And so the public money that's going that direction is much more concerning. Um, so just so that people have some idea, in 2007, um, the, the, when the tax credit scholarship in the state of Florida was still new, uh, we had $73 million from our state funds that shifted to that scholarship where students um, whose parents meet income requirements could get a scholarship to send their students to private school. And originally that was intended for our for our counties that are more rural that had less public school options. Um, it has grown over the last decade since then. That was 2007, 2008. Um, and this year... Um, there will be over a billion dollars from our state funds going to private schools. And it's coming ah. from several different sources. So there is the tax credit scholarship program, which does still have income limits in place. However, that income limit has gone up dramatically every year for the, for the last few years. Our state legislators have bumped up that income threshold. So it's now somewhere around $70,000 oh in order gosh. to get that scholarship, whereas it used to be for people who were living in poverty. Um, and, there's a new scholarship that they passed, um, not this past legislative session in 2019, but last year in, in um, spring of 2018, and it's called the Hope Scholarship, and at the time it was also referred to as the bullying bill, um, and that provides a, a scholarship for students to go to a private school um, if they've been bullied at a public school. Um, however, there, there is no proof required that a student has been bullied. The Department of Florida Department of Education has a one-page application that's, that a parent fills out, and then their student receives the money for that scholarship and can go to a private school, which we've already talked about. There's no regulations in place to make sure that that private school um, is not is protecting that student from bullying, providing certified teachers or anything along those lines. But one of the and things- there's no income requirements. There's, uh, yep, that's right. There's absolutely no income requirement for that scholarship. So, so if you make a million dollars a year and your kid, quote, gets bullied or you lie on the application and say your kid was bullied, you get in, you get a scholarship. That's right. You don't even have to pay for it. And so this is the first step in what can you do. So it's important to know that that HOPE scholarship, that bullying scholarship, the money- um, that goes towards that comes directly from the sales tax on car sales. So if you buy an automobile, you know there's a sales tax on that. Right. So if you go in to buy a car, there's a there's now a check mark, and there has been since spring of 2018, or it probably went into effect July 1st, 2019, 2018. Um, you want your sales tax to go to the Hope Scholarship. People think that's going towards education, towards public education, towards students that need a scholarship. Well, most of the dealerships are probably checking it for you. It's possible. Exactly. <laughs> and they could also be explaining it in a way because I don't think that the people at our dealerships know what right. it is. So if you have right. bought a car since July 1st of 2018 and you checked off that box for Hope Scholarship, that money is going into the fund for private school scholarships for anybody in the state who fills out a one-page form and says they were bullied that have any amount of income whatsoever. Well, it's not going specifically. School. I didn't know about any of this. Yeah. But there are people in the know. Yeah, know. we know now. Yes. <laughs> And the other money that's going into the tax credit scholarship program, that come, that the majority of that funding now, because they, they did make a slight change in the last legislative session, but for the most part, that money comes from corporate sales tax, which operates the same way. All of our corporations that pay sales tax to the state of Florida can check off a box and say, instead of that money going into the Florida general fund, we want it to go to the Florida tax credit scholarship. And it, and it goes to the Florida Tax Credit Scholarship and never comes into our general fund, which goes to our public schools. It goes directly to private schools. So it schools. completely bypasses and the And those public corporations system. are in large part liquor sales. Uh, but there are well, a lot of... There making are, a lot of money. There are yes. a lot so of corporations on the if list. drinking and yes. go to our public schools. <laughs> <laughs> now so, I'm mad. I'm not buying any more craft beer. It's expensive. The, the list is published on, on the Florida Tax Credit scholarship website. So one, that's another thing that we can do. I frequently ask companies if where they send their sell, if they, because I don't think they know either with, if they're checking that box, yeah. they don't know where it goes. So um, I'll just ask when I, in the places where I spend my money, if I can find wow. the person that handles that. Little um, known this is there. how, this is, this is where that money goes. So did you know it's going there and are you doing that? Wow. 
All right, quickly before we go, we have to give people solutions and what they yeah, can do. I think uh, citizen involvement here. Pat, Pat was ready with a list of things we can do. But um, thank you, Teresa, for the edification. And this list was developed by the Center for Public Interest at Colorado State University. There are researchers who are studying this issue nationally. So the issues we need to change in reforming charter schools, accountability, protecting our neighborhood schools, protecting taxpayer funds, and assuring a high quality education for every child, um, protecting our schools. Before a school is approved, we need to do an impact study on how it's gonna affect the schools in the locality. In our county, we have 28,000 empty seats in schools and we have 25,000 charter children right now. And um, those empty seats are in areas like Sly Middle School, Monroe Middle School, um, where they have taken children from Monroe to put them at Tinker. Monroe is about half the enrollment. And the, the middle schools are the ones with the empty seats because that's what charter schools are selling to parents. If you don't have your child in here by fourth or fifth grade, we can't guarantee you a middle school seat because parents think middle schools are terrible. So when you're uh, saying empty seats, you mean that the, the, there's that classrooms with empty. no children in empty. them and they get no money. Well, they get less money because they have less children, but what we're running is a parallel school system. Mm -hmm. Charters on one side, public on the other, and we have public buildings that we have that we need to maintain. And meanwhile, charters spending three, 400000 on buildings right. that they're going to end up keeping even yes. if they go defunct. So it's right. their, your money grab again. We need to prohibit charter schools from spending taxpayer dollars on marketing. We need to pro, uh, prohibit charter school board members and their families from financially benefiting from the schools. It's rampant, uh, the financial benefits to the charter owners. We need to stop creating new charter schools if state officials aren't going to create accountability to prevent fraud and mismanagement. All right, so we're talking about state officials. We need to get a guy named Jamie Grant unelected. Absolutely. Okay, so please, if you happen to be, if you happen to see a lady named Jessica Harrington on your ballot, check. Um, we have uh, Adam Hazardly, um, who's a rocket scientist, <laughs> and he's running against Ross Spano. If that, ha if that, if the gentleman named Hattersley happens to be on your ballot, check, because we need to uh, really call these people out by name, so that when people see their ballot, they know who's good, who's bad. Who cares about um, public education and who doesn't? It's necessary that every child, no matter where their zip code, they get a good education. Well, PTA Absolutely. made a huge difference in getting Janet Cruz elected Thank and you. Dana Young unelected. She told us that she could benefit from the bullying bill because her children were in private school. And that would be a Dana Youngism. Yeah. Yeah. But she obviously did not do that, but she said it was written so she could have benefited if she so chose. And I think it's important for people to remember that I think people get tied up in, in the word politics and, and really um, believe that everything is partisan and people are on two completely different sides of the line. And there's a difference between politics and legislation. And I think it's important for voters to actually pay attention to the votes that their legislators are taking and vote for the legislators that are doing the things that you believe in. It's really not that important what party people belong to. In my house, my husband and I belong to different parties. Okay. And for the last many, many years, we've voted the same okay. because we, at the moment, we're single issue education voters, but sometimes we vote on different issues. And what we care about is the same thing that I think most people care about. We care about our family and we care about our community. And you know, it's important to know how to people are people voting, the names, our legislators. The names well, of the yes. legislators. Speaking, speaking of that, is there anything that the um, league provides? Can I get any detailed information during um, elections that really bring but, home these things that the, um, folks are running for the and what their platforms are? The League of Women Voters and the PTA, they're both nonpartisan <laughs> um organizations right. that provide information. So they're not going to sponsor a candidate or not sponsor a candidate. 
Um, but I will tell you that um, I have created documents for the PTA and distributed them through the PTA, and I, I post the same documents on our Coffee with the Candidates page. That's the, what I'm the talking Facebook about. Facebook page, Coffee with the Candidates okay. um, Tampa. Um, I post the voting records on every issue that we care about in our community um, for everybody that's running for office in Hillsborough County. So okay. that's an invaluable resource. Yes. Slow down and say it again so okay. we can hear you. So our Facebook page is Coffee with the Candidates Tampa. And if you um, follow that page, we post not just events that we hold ourselves, um, but if um, another organization in the area is holding an event for candidates or for information, we post that as well. And we do also post voting records um, oh, awesome. of that's our, of our state at. legislators. Um, at the moment, we're doing it for um, state legislators that are running for office in Hillsborough County but I would oh, like yes. to see it those records I would like to see it out there statewide um, for all of our voters across the state because it is our state legislators that are voting on these things and the, body. the ahead, league Pat. does not endorse any candidates correct we knew that but we um, do provide lots of information on issues and the amendments so yep. we always come out with printed and uh, internet information related to uh, all these amendments we are really backing the ban assault weapons amendment okay and we're also backing the health amendment that you're Medicare aware of for all. right yep. so one last just to call names out um there was an amendment during this oh, past sorry. legislative Medicaid expansion I'm oh sorry <laughs> there was an amendment during this past legislative session that was just a tiny little amendment to the bill that was going to shift more money to private schools and the amendment was to provide oversight and transparency for those schools and every single one of our Republican um, legislators in the House voted against that amendment. It didn't do anything else except provide oversight for the money that was shifting to private schools. So Why that's important. Want that'll oversight? be a yes. That'll <laughs> well, be on our list of voting record information. And that that is a major point for reform. We need to have charter school audits to detect fraud, waste, and abuse of public funds. Absolutely. I'm going to leave it on one more note. We're, we're wrapping up for the final of the show. Should everybody listening to this show who happens to have kids join the PTA? Absolutely. Without a doubt. Why? Pat, Pat, let's let Pat and then well, you can Teresa's sum it the, up. Well, Teresa's the PTA expert, but I mean, my children, I joined the PTA years ago because you want to know what's happening at the school. You want yes. to become acquainted with the teachers and the administrators of your school as you advocate for your children and for yeah. other people's children who are too busy to join the PTA or have three jobs to make ends meet. And what about you, Teresa? PTA is the oldest and largest um, public um, education advocacy organization in the nation. So PTA is responsible for hot meals in schools. It's responsible for a, a lot of the great things that happen to our public school children to, to this day. And advocacy starts with something that our students do when they ask their teacher for something that they missed what our parents do when they go into the school to advocate for their student, when they talk to their school board members, when they talk to their state legislators, and when they talk to their national legislators. So it can be something as, as simple as taking five minutes to call the principal of the school or to call your school board member um, or you meeting up to meeting with number, your legislator. We'd so. like to give out phone numbers for the league, for PTA, if you happen to have them. I don't have a league phone number in my head. But well, we can get them on the Google. You yeah. can definitely Google. You can Google um, Hillsborough County PTA and Hillsborough County League of Women Voters, and that will have links and to... And the president is Idelia Phillips. Yes. Right. Yeah, African-American, wonderful Absolutely. Lady. We yes. love her. And uh, the school system, you can call at any time and get any school or administrator's number, 272-4000. Thank you. Well, Wonderful. this is the end of the show. I can't even believe it. We could probably go for several more hours. So much information. And the league will always come out to your organization Absolutely. and teach you about amendments yes, and voting. We would, and, and we've had them on our show more than once. They're, they really know what they're talking about and imparting awesome information all the time. <laughs> Thank you, ladies. Thank you. And we'll you. catch you again. All right.